This is BJ Mendelssohn, and BJ wants your money. Don't worry, he's not asking for a lot. Just $5. Why? Because he has a goal. BJ wants to make everyone on the planet laugh. How? By giving his comics, podcasts, and newsletters away for free. But he can't do that without your support. So what are you waiting for? Give BJ $5 today and help give the world something to laugh at. Oh, no problem. Thank you. Uh, let's we, we can dive right into it. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, you've written so many books. Uh, obviously, I've talked before about how Stinker Let's Loose is uh, a personal favorite, but you've got a new one called Passing on the Right, and I'd love to talk with you a bit about that. Thank you so much. Yeah, this new one is actually uh, sort of, you know, all my other books, uh, fictional books, usually take place in the past, except for Randy. This one is sort of in the news, you know, with the news out today about the uh, Roe versus Wade. Um, it's very much a political book in a sense. You know, I grew up in D.C. and I hate politics and I hate political humor. But it's really a book about um, entitlement and mediocrity and a lot of people that I grew up with in D.C. and then I uh, grew up with and worked with in D.C. And it's a certain type where it's... Um, you know, they don't really, you know, they sort of um, get to where they get because their parents help. And in this case, the character of Skippy Batty Battison is rich and he is mediocre, very mediocre. And he only gets where he gets because his father is a lobbyist for the soda industry in D.C. And he sort of falls into uh, the political movement of um, of uh, podcasting and uh, being a satellite radio star but only because it suits his career purposes. And his career purpose is just to become famous. So he's just a mediocre guy with very little knowledge who's, who becomes a far-right uh, podcasting and satellite radio star and ends up actually literally leading the charge at the January 6th insurrection. But how long were you were you working on this book? Like, Were you writing it at the same time that all of that happens, or did you write this, or did you start writing this after that? Well, I actually started before the January 6th insurrection i didn't know how it was going to end but once january 6 happened i thought it has to be that um it took about a year to write and um i just like the image of this moron leading the charge for entertainment reasons he's not even doing it for political reasons he's leading the charge and he's he he ends up getting caught in um uh, nancy pelosi's office doing something he should not be doing um <laughs> very much should not be doing but, you know, in his eyes, it's just all entertainment. And this is the type of person I used to see in, D in D.C., you know, in the in the back rooms, in the meeting rooms of uh, Northern Virginia. Uh, oftentimes, they didn't believe what they were pushing out politically. Right. It was just control and it was it was being involved in politics. And if one side paid more, they would they would go for it. I mean, that's what bothers me about lobbyists. You know, oftentimes they don't even believe the shit that they're trying to push forward, whether they're soda or tobacco or there's a new special on PBS about the oil industry and how much they knew uh, going back, you know, decades right. about um, global warming. So, you know, this type of person, uh, a few of my friends, parents were lobbyists and I grew up around that. And it's a very D.C. thing. It's very D.C. geekery. So really what I was doing what I wanted to do was uh, the American male mediocrity, both in politics and in comedy. And I've seen this in comedy as well, where someone rises through the ranks because they know someone or they went to Harvard Lampoon. And I sort of had a stick up my ass about that because I didn't go to Harvard, uh, very much didn't go to Harvard. And I always thought, well, who are these people to get these jobs? And, you know, I'm, I don't have a problem with that anymore since I found my own niche. But it took a long time, and I really didn't know anyone. I worked for years in retail. So it's this type of person that I used to see in D.C. It's, it's basically Kavanaugh if he gets into comedy. <laughs> and what's interesting is I always used to say, oh, uh, Kavanaugh, he's basically the type of person who was at the private school next to my public school and would throw rocks at us at recess. Well, I just found out literally he went to the private school next to my public school. Now, he's older than I am, right. but he went to modern day, which is a very Catholic school, and they would oftentimes throw rocks at us. And I remember being in Georgetown 
in the early 90s, late 80s, and I would have bottles thrown at me and called a fag from these private school kids in their white BMW convertibles. Um, and it's just this uh, very specific type of person that I despise. Right. And that's what I wanted to go after with this one. The, one of my previous books, Randy, has to do with a Maryland type, but it's more blue collar and retail. And that was the type of person I used to work. I worked 10 years in D.C., Maryland and Virginia in retail, and that was more of a, a blue collar type. And this book is more of a white collar type. Nice. And do you, I feel like you, you have a new book almost every year. Is that right? Like, it seems like you're on that kind of track where... I've become like Woody Allen, a movie every year. Um, yeah, I just, I have to do it. If I don't, I'm horribly anxious and depressed and have OCD. And I don't really know what else to do. I mean, I'm not going to go out fly fishing. <laughs> I can assure you. I went out to a driving range, a golf driving range in Maryland once. And I just thought, what the fuck am I doing here? I don't want to be here. I'd rather be back home listening to my music and writing. Right. And I have OCD terrible and depression as well. And I'm lucky enough in that the only thing that really cures well, a couple things. One's alcohol, the other's exercise, and the third is writing. Yeah. I'm, so because of that, I have to produce. I'm the same way. Um, you swap out the alcohol of weed. <laughs> like that's... Well, yeah, yeah. I could never get into that. I just felt terrible. But the first time I took alcohol, I was like, oh, this is nice. This works. And you can see why people use it as a helping mechanism. And it's something I try to avoid having been down that road. I used to live in New Orleans. And it was, you know, as soon as you stepped off the uh, airport airplane uh, in New Orleans, they're offering you very strong grain alcohol drinks. That's... So I really do try to do exercise and um, writing to sort of alleviate the symptoms of, um, and that's what I tell young students. It's like, this is an energy. OCD is an energy. And if you can funnel that energy into something positive rather than circling the drain and not leaving your room, um, you can produce a lot. You really can. You're not going to necessarily be happy. But I know this for, I didn't realize you had uh, OCD and, yeah. but you produce a tremendous amount and I'm, I'm assuming that's because you feel you have to. Yeah, constantly. I, I just need to constantly be doing something. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm miserable. Um, <laughs> that's what it right. comes down to. Uh, let, yeah. let me ask you, though. So there's also a companion book that came out with Passing on the Right um, about a conversation with you in a, in a PR person, which I absolutely love uh, being a former PR person and knowing like how dumb <laughs> some of the people are uh, yeah, you said it not me yeah well so i'd love to know like <laughs> so this was was this a it's a fictionalized version of the conversation you had with a pr professional is that sort of the yeah what happened was i always recommend to young writers never hire a pr professional because and i've been dealing with them for many years and and both as a writer and as an editor at vanity fair i'm always receiving pitches and quite frankly it's just white noise it doesn't really mean anything in fact, it can even be harmful. But in this case, I thought, I'll give it a shot. I have a little extra money. And I will hire someone who's been successful with uh, a writer, a, a humor writer. Um, and he sort of specializes in humor. So I hired this guy for 3000 a month. And he said he was doing me a favor. Typically, it's 6000 for two months. Uh, so 3000 a month and literally did nothing. And what you see, I mean, you said it's fictionalized, and it is. These aren't C-SPAN transcripts, but I can tell you that it is based 100% in truth. And it's, it's a real problem because especially when it comes to comedy, those people you hire to promote your product typically do not understand your sensibility. It's a very specific type of sensibility. You know, the original PR people didn't understand Mr. Show or The Simpsons when it started or, or SNL. They have to be explained. It's only as good as they're told. And he never, even towards the end, understood what the book was about. So it was a lesson for me. But I thought instead of wasting all that money, maybe I can recoup some of my investment. And I put out this digital only book uh, that is very short it's like 80 pages and it's basically just an interstitial dialogue between me and this guy and each day there's a new page right uh, so i've noticed that you you're running ads on twitter so are you doing those by yourself now like if you moved on from a pr person you, now you're just sort of 
I'm done with I'm done with that. And actually, I have to say, uh, you know, um, working with you on on your work has has really taught me a lot, and uh, I totally agree uh, with what you uh, are out there telling people because I think the majority of it is total bullshit. And there are tricks to do, you know, what I'm trying to do now is send these books to friends who are comedians and actors who have a lot of followers on Instagram and what have you and get them involved, um, not to tell them to promote it, but if they like it, they can talk about it. But to force it upon people is, uh, I think, a big mistake. Um, but I also have a very narrow email list of people who have signed up at my website or I know like comedy and i will send out uh very specific uh bursts of emails to these people but to go wide i think is a big mistake with pr especially when it comes to humor because it's a very specific sensibility yeah you need the word of mouth like you, you really need people championing it for you i think it's a very murky mysterious uh issue for me what works and what doesn't work why does something become word of mouth while something else doesn't and i don't know the answer to that and i don't think anyone maybe beyond you knows the answer to that uh but you seem to have figured it out which i find incredibly impressive i've been you know i have 10 books out i still cannot figure it out i know what not to do at this point <laughs> but i i look at it as like um you know you lift off it's like an airplane lifting off and whether it reaches cruising altitude and stays there seems to be beyond my capability. And that's that's the murky part for me. Yeah, it seems, it, it honestly, more often than not, is like when you're writing a joke and you, you put the joke out there and you think it's hilarious and it falls flat on its face. And then you put out a joke that you're kind of like, ah, and then that's the one that takes off. So there is no exact science. Like There, there is so much randomness that, and I'm constantly trying to tell people, um, it's like getting struck by lightning, really. Like you can do a certain amount. Like in my, my book, um, I was able to sell about seven thousand copies of it. Wow. Um, but that was but that was sheer brute force, just every day contact. And that was also pre pandemic, where you could yeah. still go to a bookstore and still do local signings uh, and and benefit from all the local press coverage. Uh, but let me ask you: so, with with the book a year, are you finding that the audience is now like? They're, like they're anticipating the next book like do you have the people no. that just that you're emailing i don't think they're anticipating it i mean I, there's so much stimuli out there i'm competing with so much that uh you know if they see it they'll say oh good good I, all i want for them to to do is just to purchase it once a year I, I don't want anyone necessarily looking forward to it but what i'm trying to do too is that and i learned this from stinker let's loose that once something exists in the world it can exist in other formats. So it came out with a self-published version that I put out and had my girlfriend design. Um, and it became, because the book was out, it became an audio book. And it was out there and then John Hamm signed, signed on or Ray Seahorn, Paul F. Tompkins, Andy Richter. So when something is tangible, you can then do more with it. If I had, if I tried to pitch this as an audio book from the get go, no one would have understood it. But if you, if they could hold something in their hands, it makes a big difference. So that is a lesson where I'll try to put out a book. It'll also be a digital book. Then it'll be an audio book. And then hopefully it can be some sort of production, whether it's an audio production, TV or movie. But I do try to put it out where if worse comes to worse, there's still something tangible on my bookshelf. It, it's not just a pitch that I've been working on for four years. Right. And I want to talk about the, the design for your books because they're they have been spectacular. Um, was it was it Slouchers was the Gen X book? Slouchers from, was the Gen yeah. X book. Yeah. Uh, that is one of the most beautifully designed books that I have seen in oh my like God, the, thank you. the past five years. Like it's there's just this level of detail in it that I don't think you you just see that often. So, like just from a craftsmanship point of view, I, I'm curious. Like, did you for that book in particular? Did you approach it with the idea like that someone would be writing in the margins? Like, yeah. Well, I, well, first of all, thank you. I mean, that's, that means so much, and uh, a lot of. You know, design to me is a lot, and I think that's a that's the problem mistake with most self published authors is they don't get a 
book designer to design. You can see if it's amateurish. Now, I'm lucky enough to have a, well, soon be married to my girlfriend who is the top designer at Random House. So she is an artist who can design these. But for the past few books, she's been busy, so I, I hired out a freelancer. And it's someone who specifically designs exterior and interior of books. And what I wanted to do with that one is to have a story within a story. And I first of all wanted to sell as new a seemingly used book that would have come out in the early 2000s that would have been marked up like a college student would have marked it up and there would have been a story with her markings and her relationship to the text which doesn't really mean anything to her because it happened 10 years before it obviously means something to the professor who's older so I wanted to have a few things working there and to have doodles in there and to have notes because I often buy used books and one of my favorite things to see are notes. And usually uh, within these notes, they're just they're just whatever the professor is telling them they're writing down and or just very obvious things like this is when she falls in love with him, you know, sort of like that. So I wanted to do that within the framework of this 19 early 1990s Gen X film and the uh, designer, I thought she did a great job with that. I mean, th that's her handwriting throughout the book. Oh, nice, very cool. Uh, well, please, please pass my my uh, my gratitude and thanks. Oh, I certainly him. will. Thank uh, you. Because it's it is it is very cool, and I'm going to recommend that. Every, I'll put it in the show notes too, so people thank you can so much. Like yeah. to see a picture. Um, but let me ask you, what? There's so many different things I want to ask you. I'm like watching the time. But well, first if I of all, to... there's no time limit for me, so you can keep going. Oh. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a work thing at one thirty that I got to hop to. Um, Wait a second, nine more minutes? <laughs> That's yeah. it? That's Yeah, usually these are only 20, 25 minutes. Oh, my goodness. These are, these are right. super short. It's been going um, fast. But we could, we could do another one if you're if you're available and interested. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just enjoying talking with you. <laughs> Uh, but let me let me ask you because I want to just I, I know that you've moved away from these interview books, but yeah. I, I just wanted to ask about them because they were very um, they were very core and influential to me um, because I I had really struggled when when Poking Dead Frog had came out um, and here's the kicker it came out like that was the time in my life when I was really struggling with what I want to do and mm -hmm. I, I was afraid of going into comedy rank because I didn't understand it and so having like this perspective from people from old radio shows. That you know, maybe people don't remember now, but just having their their voice and the voice of TV writers was so great. And I just am curious, like, have you heard from people that have read those books that have said, "Yo, know, like this really opened my eyes, or I, I learned something from it that I just never expected"? Yeah, I mean, I, I just feel very lucky because I did it for uh, personal, somewhat selfish reasons, and that was really to pick the brains of the people whose work I really liked. You know, to me, growing up in Maryland, I didn't know any writers. I didn't know anyone who knew any writers. So it was a very distant world. And I didn't have any books on comedy writing. There's a few on SNL, and there's a few on your show shows and MASH and that sort of thing. But there was nothing with the shows that I grew up with that were current. And I wanted to interview uh, those people who influenced me and to basically tell me what should I do and what should I not do to achieve success. You've been through it. Can you save me time? Do you have any advice, both career-wise and writing-wise? And really, the book was for myself in high school, skipping math class to go to the library to see if I could find any books that interested me. And uh, yeah, I put out these two books, and, I ha and I've been lucky for a few reasons. One is that I got to talk to a generation of comedy writers that no longer exists. Quite a few passed away after, and here's the kicker. Um, and to be able to talk to someone who wrote for the Marx Brothers, to be able to talk to someone who wrote for Bob Hope in World War II, uh, this is it's like talking to Babe Ruth or Lou Gehrig or Ty Cobb. I mean, to me, it's a bridge to another time. So I feel very lucky to have done that. And also, I do I am very appreciative that a lot of younger writers have come upon these books and have been able to take away not what I've been saying, but what these people have been saying. If there's, if I have been able to say one thing, it is that you can do it. doesn't matter where you're from, who you are. It is not a mystery that you can't bridge. You can, you can get from here to there. I'm like, when I was growing up, you had to go to the Harvard Lampoon. And that was pretty much it. Now anyone can do it. And comedy has become a lot better because of that. And if I can get that one 
thing through that you can do it if you do certain things and, and avoid other things. If you wend your way through those path of that path to success, it is something you can reach and is not beyond you. Anyone can do it anywhere. And you know, I've heard from people in Iran uh, across the world, and to me, I love that. I mean, it doesn't matter where you're from. If someone is into comedy, especially the same comedy you are, they're family. And the fact that someone in Iran is watching Mr. Show or The Simpsons, I, it's just I, to me that's magic, and that didn't happen. Yes with me growing up pre-internet, but the fact that this family can now come together, I think it's just amazing. Yeah, I, I was just about to ask you, uh, what's what's the best advice that you would give, but I, I feel like... Well, it would be like uh, to keep going uh, and to never uh, quit um, if you really feel it in you and to be true to yourself sensibility-wise and to make yourself laugh and not others. Also, you don't need the keys to the kingdom given to you. You can create them on your own. If you're waiting for permission to make it, you might be waiting a long time. And those gatekeepers may not get your sense of humor. So make it happen. Put out a book. You can do that now. Put out a, a, a podcast. You can do that now. Make your own movie. You can do that now. I mean, this is magic. This is never, this is the first time ever that a creative person can do this. You know, I would have to rent a camera when I was a kid, a video camera, and it was very expensive. I couldn't afford it. Now you can go out with a phone and do it. You can get your stuff out there make it put it out there make it tangible and good things tend to happen when it's out there i think that's great uh where where can we buy the book where can we buy slouchers where can we buy sneaker that's loose? Well, it's available uh at wherever you shop independent amazon barnes and noble uh digital and regular and i should say this i have a new book coming out from mcsweeney's which is a college catalog parody which will be out next week and that will it's called nice. Welcome to Woodmont, and it is available on McSweeney's website. This is BJ Mendelssohn, and BJ wants your money. Don't worry, he's not asking for a lot, just $5. Why? Because he has a goal. BJ wants to make everyone on the planet laugh. How? By giving his comics, podcasts, and newsletters away for free. But he can't do that without your support. So what are you waiting for? Give BJ $5 today and help give the world something to laugh at.